I just want to say thank you to Haney for having me here. I went from ResusX attendee to ResusX question mic hander. Okay, no. faculty. I, uh, I'm excited to be here. So, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about a really interesting topic. As resuscitationists, we're all well aware of the life and limb threats, right? But we can't forget about the vision threats, because that's just as important. I think we would all agree our vision is probably one of the most important senses that we have. I just have one disclosure, and that's that I've been on a little bit of a artificial intelligence kick recently. So a lot of the pictures you, you've, you'll see here uh, have been generated by a AI bot called Midjourney. Uh, and honestly, they're pretty phenomenal looking. Thought it would be interesting. All right. Start off with a case. Typical day in the emergency department. You just saw your ninth chest pain patient. You're sitting at the computer putting in orders, and you hear your familiar page overhead. Beep. Attention ED staff, we have a trauma system activation for a trauma alert. 30-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle accident. Injury sustained to the face and head. ETA, 30 minutes. So you finish putting in the orders for your chest pain patient. Walk over to the trauma bay and prep your equipment, prep your team, and EMS wheels in this patient. As they're transferring him over to the stretcher, they start to give you a history. You hear that he was in a motor vehicle accident, hit his head on the steering wheel, was not wearing his seatbelt. Relatively low uh, speed, I think they said somewhere around less than 30 miles an hour. No loss of consciousness, he did his hit his head on the steering wheel, as I mentioned. As, you, as they transfer him over, you begin your primary survey. His airway is intact, he's got bilateral breath sounds, his pulses are all present. As you do his disability exam, his GCS is 15, that's good, but you look at his eyes because you want to check his pupils and things just don't look right. You shine the light in his pupils and something's off, you can't quite put your finger on it. And you see there's a lot of trauma around his right eye. You say, you tell the team, we're gonna come back to this, it looks important, but we're gonna come back to this after we finish our primary survey. You expose the patient, log roll him, Primary survey complete, no life-threatening injuries. X-ray comes in, they do their thing while you start your secondary survey. Start head to toe and you look at his eyes and not the best picture of what this patient looks like but the best that AI could generate with uh, what I gave it. Um, sw think, just close your eyes and think, swollen, right eye, closed, can't get it open very easily. Uh, there's a lot of edema around this right eye, some abrasions all over his face, lacerations on his face. You do your best to kind of pry his eye open. You look in there. You can't get a great view. You ask him, can you see what's going on? What's, what, what do you notice? And he says, Doc, I, I can't see out of this right eye. You remember back to an MRAP episode where they talked about this, and you realize you might be dealing with orbital compartment syndrome. In case you want to go back and listen to that MRAP episode, it was April 2023, just uh, in case you want to go back. All right. So orbital compartment syndrome, what is it? Basically, this is a condition in which there's rapidly increasing and sustained high intraocular pressures, and the pressure within the orbit can ultimately re result in ischemia of the optic nerve and the retina. The duration of how long this can present until you have permanent damage is still debated, but I think a number to hang your hat on is about 90 minutes. I would say as soon as you diagnose it, you should immediately treat it. But because of the time-sensitive nature of this diagnosis, the emergency physician plays an incredibly important uh, role in the diagnosis and management of this condition. So that's why I'm talking to, this, talking to you about this today. So what are some of the signs and symptoms involved in this? Uh, obviously things like proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, decreased visual acuity, a relative afferent pupillary defect. That one's an interesting one, RAPD or APD as some people keep uh, talking about that. Um, the best way to learn RAPD or APD is to watch a video on it. It's hard for me to explain it in person, but just very briefly as you shine a light between the eyes, you get a normal pupillary response with the normal unaffected eye and an abnormal response with the affected eye. So go watch a video on that because I can't do it justice by trying to explain it. Tense globe, tight eyelids, and if you're able to 
get any kind of fundoscopic exam, which let's be honest, none of us are doing fundoscopic exams in the ER, papilledema and central retinal artery pulsations can be some other signs that you'll see. Elevated intraocular pressures, we're going to come back to that. Now, really focusing in on the eye exam, you want to get a good visual acuity exam. When I say good, I mean dumb it down for the, st the basic ER doc like me. Can they read letters on a Snellen chart? Can they, if they can't read letters, can they count my fingers? If they can't count my fingers, can they see motion, me waving my hand in front of their face? If they can't see that, then can they see light? Okay, so those are, that's an easy way to just grade your visual exam. Double vision, corneal abnormalities, uh, the way you'll test that is with your fluorescein staining and a Woods lamp. And then signs of globe rupture. You've got to be really careful with this one. You don't want to push down on the eye just to diagnose this. Um, but obviously, if you put a little pressure and you see some fluid extruding from the eyeball, you should certainly be concerned about globe rupture. All right, I said we'd come back to it. The intraocular pressure. Normal is anywhere less than about 20. Okay, These are easy numbers for the, e the simple ER doc. 20, 30, 40. 20, normal. 30, you're making a phone call to the ophthalmologist because something is wrong. And 40, you're making that phone call, but you're also going to cut and take care of this uh, life thre or vision threatening injury immediately. So <clears throat> here's some of the relevant anatomy uh, beneath the skin. We're going to talk about much of this in our workshop later uh, across the hall this morning and this afternoon. We'll have two sessions. But just to give you a little bit of a preview, the orbit itself is the entire kind of um, the, the area that holds the, the oculus or the globe. And what holds the globe in place is a conjunction of bones, muscles, tendons, and fascia. So all of these hold the globe in place. When we do the procedure to uh, treat or orbital compartment syndrome, which is called the lateral canthotomy and inferior cantholysis, we actually snip that inferior lateral canthal, canthal tendon right in this region in order to allow the globe to prop toes forward and relieve the pressure behind the eyeball that's causing the, the, amount, the um, pressure. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but the most common cause of orbital compartment syndrome is a retrobulbar hematoma, which is a hematoma or amount of bleeding that's behind the globe itself, pushing forward on that eyeball against very rigid structures in the front of the face. So what are the pieces of equipment that you're going to need? They're right here. We'll talk about this again in our workshop, but briefly, some, something to clean off the eye, something uh, to use to numb up that region of the eye, the lateral area. A preferably straight clamp to crush the soft tissue, tooth forceps, some scissors. Uh, if you listen to that MRAP episode, which I was doing this morning just to review, they actually recommend blunt scissors so that you don't cause injury to the eye. Uh, in this image, I included an iris scissors and then some gauze. All right, if you want to take a photo of one thing, take a photo of this. This is the key slide uh, for two reasons. One, this QR code takes you to a paper that I actually had the opportunity to write with some of my uh, mentors in residency and a co-resident as well. And basically, this is an overview of orbital compartment syndrome, lateral canthotomy, cantholysis, and pearls and pitfalls specifically for the emergency physician. And these pearls and pitfalls I condensed into this nice little infographic here. And we're going to talk about just three pearls and three pitfalls just to uh, hone in on specific ones. All right, pearl number one. Always be prepared for orbital compartment syndrome and lateral canthotomy inferior cantholysis. You never know when you're going to need this. And when you do, you don't want to be stuck in a situation where you're unable to perform this. So be prepared, read about it, watch some videos, go listen to that MRAP episode. Uh, speaking of MRAP, they actually have a really great video on this that Jess Mason put together that covers the entire procedure on a live patient as well as simulated on some graphics. Pearl number two, consult ophthalmology early. You want to get the ophthalmologist involved early for multiple reasons, the chief of which is they're going to be seeing this patient down the line. And so if they want to come in to do a physical exam early on in the patient's course, uh, that's very important that you call them early. I'm going to touch, touch on this later, I believe. But 
there also is a chance that your procedures may not completely relieve the pressure in, within the eyeball. And so they may need to take the patient to the operating room to lower the pressure and do additional procedures. Pearl number three, document your physical exam thoroughly. Do every part of the physical exam for the eye on this one, save perhaps the fundoscopic exam. Everything needs to be documented thoroughly because the uh, ophthalmologist who's going to be seeing the patient inpatient is going to want to have all the details from the beginning so they can trend these physical exam findings. Moving on to the pitfalls. Pitfall number one, delaying definitive care for any reason. This is my opinion. You have the amount of time, so once you make the diagnosis of orbital compartment syndrome, the amount of time you have to perform this procedure is you, you can make a phone call to the ophthalmologist, you can gather your supplies, and you probably have just enough time to review the procedure by watching a video on it. Anything beyond that, I, I, I should also allow you to talk to the patient and make sure that they're comfortable with it. I'm sure that's very important. But anything beyond that, you should not delay in order to do this procedure if you've made the diagnosis. Pitfall number two, over-reliance on imaging. Did I mention this is a clinical diagnosis? Orbital compartment syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. You see the signs and symptoms, you make your phone call, and you cut. There are imaging findings that go along with orbital compartment syndrome. Take a look at the paper, but just briefly to explain, there are a few different angles that you can measure in this image. The normal eyeball is on the left, the uh, abnormal is on the right. So there are specific angle cutoffs that you can use to diagnose orbital compartment syndrome. You will also be able to find both on ultrasound and CT, if you've got a retrobulbar hematoma, that optic nerve actually tethers the back of the eyeball and creates this guitar pick-like sign. And finally, pitfall number three, failure to decrease the intraocular pressure. So you've done your lateral canthotomy and your inferior cantholysis, you remeasure your intraocular pressure, but it's still not under 40. What do you do next? Well, the first thing you can do is consider a superior cantholysis. This part of the procedure is fraught with a little more complications because one, you've got some arteries that run in this region, but additionally, you've got the lacrimal gland and lacrimal duct in that upper uh, lateral upper region. So you have to be very careful to avoid those structures. Additionally, you can also use medical management. There are drops that you can use and medications you can give to the patient to help decrease the intraocular pressure as well. All right, I got to go on vacation last week in Vermont. And while I was on vacation with my family, beautiful area, the colors were amazing, fall changing colors, it was lovely. I was also prepping lateral canthotomy models for you guys to do over uh, across the hall in our workshop. So stay tuned for that. That's all I have for you today. I'd be happy to take any questions, but we're going to chat more uh, during the workshop session. <laughs> <laughs>